My name is Kendrick, and I'm at Washington University in St. Louis, and thank you for your attention here. I'd like to start off by acknowledging my co-authors, in particular John Winower, who's now here at NYU, Brian Wandel is my postdoc advisor at Stanford, and Jack Allen, who is my PhD advisor at Berkeley. This talk has two parts. The first part's a rant, where I'll essentially discuss some conceptual issues. And then the second part, I'll describe some results. Ultimately, I think visual representation can, boil, can be boiled down to the simple fact that different stimuli drive different areas. Here's a little animation. This is a brain. Let's focus in on the cortical surface and zoom in on the back, since that's where visual cortex resides. Now we have a wide array of stimuli we can choose from, such as these, and we want to know which stimuli will drive responses at different parts of the visual system. For example, we might observe these stimuli drive responses here, and we might observe these stimuli drive responses here, and already, based on this kind of observation, we can start to have some intuitions on how representation works. Of course, reality may be a little more messy, and we might observe this, these responses driving responses here, and it may be a little less clear what's going on. Now, ultimately, we want to characterize not only that this or that stimulus drives responses, but we also want to say something about the properties of those stimuli that's driving the response. So we can summarize then our goal is to figure out what stimulus properties, or you might use the term stimulus dimension, will, is driving responses in each area. And I think that's basically it, and the rest is just details. Now, the classic approach to studying representation involves what we might call a tuning curve approach. Basically, we hypothesize some stimulus dimension, we construct some stimuli that vary along that dimension, and then we go measure responses. So, if we think orientation is important in V1, we might use these sinusoidal gradings that vary in orientation. If we think curvature is important in V4, we might use these angle stimuli. And if we think object category is important in IT, we might use these objects. Now this of course provides useful information, but I think ultimately provides an incomplete picture. The idea is, in any given area, many stimuli will drive responses, not just the stimuli you chose. A different approach, which I favor, and which probably the other speakers would also agree, is to sample a very wide range of stimuli, such as all of the stimuli shown here, and then come up with a general model that can potentially explain responses to all stimuli. The term I like to use for this is general predictive models. The term general emphasizes that these models should operate for a wide range of stimuli. And the term predictive emphasizes the importance of cross-validation. That is, we hold out some stimuli, train up our model, and then check the predictions on those held out stimuli. Let's look at a simple example, and we've already seen this earlier in the symposium, but I'll go through it anyway. I think the canonical example is the linear filter model of simple cells in V1. Here's a little schematic. We're recording from a simple cell, and we might observe some responses. Now, the question is, can we come up with a general model that can explain all of these observations? And in fact, we can, and that's given as follows. We start with the stimulus, it's just a spatial pattern of light intensities, and we compute a weighted sum according to these weights here, just as you saw earlier, and that is our predicted response. The power of this model is its generality. If it's accurate, then it will predict not only each of these individual tuning curves, but also any other potential tuning curve you might wish to measure. Now, of course, this is a simple example. We don't have to hold ourselves to a linear model as shown here. We can use any computation at all that you like. And also on the response side, we don't only have to talk about, say, the spiking rate of a, of a neuron, but we can use other measures of neural activity that we have access to. Now for the skeptics in the audience, maybe not the speakers, but you guys, um, you may think this approach is too hard and that it'll never fully work for the visual system. I have no good response other than to question whether we've actually tried hard enough. You might think alternatively that this approach is okay, but it's only going to work for quote unquote low level processing, or you might use the term bottom up or feed forward. I'm not sure where this sentiment comes from since there's nothing in how the approach is laid out that makes it specific to what you might say is quote unquote low level. I don't know what that means actually, so, but I'm just going to use those words. And finally, you might think this approach is limited because it ignores top-down cognitive processes, which Thomas actually mentioned. 
I completely agree with this, but I think it's also possible to model those top-down effects. And I have a talk on Monday that where I uh, will go over some uh, work on how I've gone about doing this. Now, even if you think it's a good idea to develop these models, maybe you're thinking it's not your problem. I'm going to try to disabuse you of that notion, and I'm going to use this simple example of FFA, or fusiform face area. Now, it may seem like we understand this area. We know how to drive it. It's face selective. This seems to explain the observed data. Case closed. Let's not worry about anything else. I think there's two issues with this kind of word model explanation. The first is it's not quantitative, and we can't really test this. For example, what's the prediction for a stimulus that's not clearly a face and not clearly a non-face? The second issue is a little more subtle, and it has to do with the fact that faceness is a construct of our own visual system. Let's look at a little cartoon here. This is you. You have some eyes, and you're looking at these two stimuli. Now, using your brain, you can realize that stimulus one is a face, and then you can go off and use that in your favorite neuroscience experiment. Everything seems fine, but let's think about what has happened. We have this word face, and we're just using our own visual system to decide what stimulus to apply it to. But there's something a little circular here. The only reason we can do this is because we have a visual system, and presumably an FFA, that's activating in response to the stimulus. The key question is, that's not answered, is how did this activation arise? How did these neurons in this particular brain area make this decision? So in a sense, I'm kind of saying to not use your visual system when you're studying the visual system, as it gives you a false sense of understanding. Ha ha ha. So this is a convenient point to address the symposium questions. I think selectivity for categorical stimuli, like faces, is a very important aspect of the visual system. And I think the most critical open question is how the visual system, the neurons, generates those representations. In other words, how does the brain decide that a face is a face? To answer that question, I think we need to take the time to construct carefully uh, careful construction of a wide range of stimuli, for example, stimuli that are cl clearly a face, stimuli that are clearly not a face, and stimuli that lie somewhere in between. And I think making those types of careful measurements will provide useful insight into how the brain is making this decision. So to conclude this little rant, I'm asking for less words, more code, which is kind of common with the previous speaker, and also more generality, as I talk, spent, spent a little time on, both in the stimuli that we use in our experiments and the models that we construct. So let's move on to part two. The general experimental approach I've taken involves measuring visual responses using fMRI and trying to understand the representation of grayscale images. I try to develop these general predictive models for single voxels, typically reflecting activity on the scale of two millimeters. And there are plenty of methodological details that we need to be aware of when we try to do this type of work. In particular, I developed in a separate project a denoising technique that I used on my own data, which I find very useful. And I encourage you to check it out if you're interested. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to review a series of studies where I have developed better models of extrastriate representation. There's three studies, each corresponding to, each of them corresponds to a model, and we'll briefly walk through each of these models. So the first model is a filter model, and you actually saw this many times already, and we just fly through it. Um, and to develop that model, we conducted this experiment in the MR scanner. Subjects simply fixated the center, and we presented a series of grayscale natural photographs. We, we presented a large number of these. Then we asked with this data set, given the responses observed at each individual voxel, can we come up with a general predictive model? Here's the model we developed, a simple model based on V1 conceptions. We start with the image, apply a bank of filters. Filters occur at different positions, spatial scales and orientations. Each filter is computing a weighted sum of the image, just as we saw in our earlier example. Filter outputs are squared sum and square rooted, which is the standard V1 complex cell energy model. We then take these filter outputs, apply a set of weights and sum to give the predicted response. So in terms of free parameters, I should mention these filters were fixed. And what we're estimating are the optimal set of weights to describe each individual voxel. Now, we found that this model works reasonably well in V1, and we actually did some decoding with it. I won't go into details there. 
Um, but importantly, the performance of this model degrades in extra striate areas. And so the question is why? So that leads us to this next study. Now, a basic fact of extra striate responses is receptive fields are larger. And what that means is these neurons are integrating information over larger regions of the visual field. Now, the filter model you just saw presumes that this integration or summation process is linear, but maybe that assumption is inaccurate. So here's what we did. We collected these, measured these uh, stimuli. These are just high contrast noise patterns that are changing their location in the visual field. And with this data, we are able to examine this issue of spatial summation or spatial linearity. Let's look at an example. This is the receptive field location we determined for one voxel in V3, and then on the right, we're going to look at its responses. Now, when this noise pattern hits the bottom half of the receptive field, we observe a good response. We hit the other half, and we also observe a reasonable response. Now, under the assumption of spatial linearity, we would expect that when we stimulate the whole receptive field, we would, would observe the sum of these earlier two responses. However, in matter of fact, this voxel does not, and this voxel shows sub-additive summation. And this gives us some insight into why the earlier filter model may be failing. So how do we deal with this effect? We developed a pretty simple model. So we start with the stimulus, and we convert that into what we call a contrast image that just indicates the location of the stimulus. We then compute a weighted sum of this contrast image using a two-dimensional Gaussian. You can think of this as the receptive field. That produces a single number, which we subject to a compressive power law nonlinearity. And then that gives us the predicted response. And what's doing the critical work here is this nonlinearity, so let's see how that works. In the linear case, when the stimulus doesn't hit the receptive field, the x-axis is zero, that's the weighted sum, and there's no response. Now when the stimulus hits half the receptive field, we get half the maximum response. And then when the stimulus hits the entire receptive field, we get exactly double the response, and this is the linear case. Now let's see what happens if there's a compressive nonlinearity. We stimulate half the receptive field, and already we have a very large response. And so when we stimulate the entire receptive field, there's only a small increment in the response. And this is exactly the sub-additive effect that we need. We call this model the compressive spatial summation, or CSS model, because what's happening is we're summating across the visual field, but in a compressive fashion. So that leads us to the last study, which is a logical follow-up to the first two. Recall we started with this filter model. This was a general model that operated for grayscale images. And then we developed this other model with this new nonlinear component. However, this model wasn't fully general since it only operated for these stimuli that varied in spatial location. So in this most recent study, I merged these two models in the following way. Take the filters, use that here, summation and compressive nonlinearity. So just briefly what's happening is this Gaussian is playing the same role that these weights played in the first model, except that the Gaussian is a much simpler and more compact description of the weights. Conversely, we see the filters are playing the same role that the contrast image plays, except that the filters provide an explicit way to compute contrast for an arbitrary image. Now there's other components we added, I won't have time to go into, device of normalization, which is a well-known nonlinearity in the electrophysiological literature. And importantly, the introduction of the second order contrast nonlinearity, which I should mention, this concept has a long history in psychophysics. So let's look at this one last component in a little more detail. So here's a stimulus, and let's see what happens after the first two stages of the model are complete we get this, which is essentially a map of contrast energy. Each pixel indicates the amount of local contrast in the original stimulus. So let's see this again for one more stimulus. This is just a grading, and it looks like this. Now for a hypothetical receptive field, if we do not have this nonlinearity, then essentially responses are uh, proportional to first order contrast, which is simply sort of like the total contrast energy within the receptive field. Formally, that's just given by, as follows. Here, x sub i refers to the contrast of the ith pixel, and w sub i is the weight associated with the ith pixel, and these weights are just coming from a two-dimensional Gaussian, as indicated by the circle. So under this model, this would predict a very large response to both stimuli. But in fact, in extra stride areas, they respond very weakly to this stimulus. And so we propose instead that what's happening is that responses are sensitive to contrast of contrast. So in other words, contrast within this little receptive field region. 
to formalize that, we use the statistical concept of variance. Variance is just deviations relative to the mean, and that's exactly the difference between these two uh, formula here. So what we're doing is we're subtracting off the mean contrast energy from the x sub i before we square in sum. There is a free parameter c that allows us to control how strong this uh, nonlinearity is. So that is why this model is called SOZ, second order contrast. So how well does this model work? Uh, we used a wide range of stimuli to develop and test this model. I don't have time to go into, but I will show you the data from a single voxel in V2. Each black bar is the response to a distinct stimulus, and the error bars are 68% confidence intervals. I'm just gonna flip through the variety of stimuli that we used. All right, and then to validate the model, we use the approach of cross-validation. We're going to use five-fold cross-validation, ignore a fifth, train up the model with its free parameters, and then predict that fifth and do this five times. And I'm going to show you the cross-validated predictions of that procedure. First, though, let's start with a simple model. A model that only includes these two components is akin to the filter model, the very first model we started with. Here are the cross-validated predictions. Qualitatively matching, but quantitatively quite horrible. Let's add in some additional components. This is akin to the compressive summation model, the second model. Here are the cross-validated predictions. Quantitatively much better, but not very satisfactory even though the correlation from this model would be 0.7. So I think it's important to realize 0.7 is not actually that great. Finally, let's add in this last nonlinearity, second order contrast. Here are the cross-validated predictions. Notice it's doing a reasonable job capturing all most of the important features in the data. Of course, this is just one voxel. It's a pretty good voxel, but there are population results. You can check out the paper. So to conclude, I started off with a little rant where I convinced, tried to convince you of the importance of general predictive models. Then I reviewed a series of studies. The first study used a simple model based on filters, introduced a new model that uh, added this nonlinearity, and then the last model integrated the first two and added yet another nonlinearity. And these nonlinearities I have found to be important for explaining the responses in extra striate regions. Just to conclude, let me just mention some ongoing work. We've taken this paradigm into ECOG, which stands for electrocorticography. This is a direct measure of electrical activity in epileptic patients. And the short story is the data we observe is remarkably similar to what we see with fMRI. And please see Dora's poster on Wednesday um, if you have a chance, if you're interested in this work. And also, we've taken this kind of approach into tackling high-level areas using fMRI. And I have a talk on Monday morning if you're interested in that. Thank you very much.